in three, two, one. We are live for a new episode of Electric Podcast. I am Fred Lambert, your host. And as usual, I'm joined by Seth Wintraum. How are you doing this week, Seth? I'm good. All right. Probably better than me. Just came back from nice 10 hours of travel today. I'm probably sounding even more uh, heavy on the noise as usual. <laughs> I think I'm feeling a little bit sick. But I'm going to power through for you guys because that's how much I love this podcast and I love you guys. <laughs> Uh, and we have uh, some cool things to talk about today. Uh, maybe not good news to start with. Uh, we're going to discuss the Tesla delivery estimates. So in the U.S., Tesla is still the major player when it comes to EV volumes. They still are the difference maker in the market. So it makes a big difference for EV adoption. And now this this quarter is kind of weird. Like uh, Tesla has been a growth story like every quarter Year-over-year year growth, at the very least, uh, most often than not quarter-to-quarter quarter growth, though there's been some exception and there's been like some like very specific event that has negatively affected sales, nothing too crazy. We're used to it. But for the most part, Tesla keeps increasing production. And even though the demand side of things have been rough over the last year, there's been a lot of price cuts to match the demand to the production. They've been able to do it. But now... We have a different situation this quarter, not not necessarily for the demand, but for, for both, for both demand issues, both demand concern, I should say, and production issues at the same time. So uh, what happened this week is there was a, a, a several consecutive downgrades in terms of delivery estimates from Wall Street, from analysts in general. Uh, so if you remember last quarter, Q4 2023, Tesla delivered a record number of 484,000 vehicles. That was a 20% year-over-year growth. Um, and for comparison, if you want to do a Q1 to Q1 comparison, Tesla delivered 422,000 vehicles in Q1 2023. Um, now, just a few days ago, just starting off the week, the delivery estimate was 479,000 vehicles for Tesla in Q1 2024. Uh, we should have like a decent idea of it with a quarter ending in just a few uh, a few weeks, two weeks. And um, but that now that that estimate has just dropped like crazy this week uh, because people are revising it because four hundred seventy nine thousand that would have been nice that would have been a very good year over year increase a sequential small decrease but nothing too crazy nothing completely unusual for a Q four to Q one though last year Q four to Q one this slide actually did increase delivery so. Not a great look there. But now what happened this week? Yeah, Dutch Bank reducing their estimate to 427,000 deliveries for Q1, which would be a Big massive drop. This, yeah, massive drop. Uh, you have UBS, which was already below the consensus at 466,000, dropped that to 432,000 units. Um, and there was a bunch of other ones too, maybe like smaller than UBS and Dutch Bank, which are bigger Wall Street firms. Uh, but... What I'm seeing right now is like most estimates are between 425,000 units and uh, 425 and 435,000 units for Q1, which would be a big drop from Q4 and basically like a, a, just a slight like two point growth for uh, year over year, which is completely unusual for Tesla. And bigger concern, it might be the story of the year and so it might be like it, kept, it might keep going throughout the year which is a concern now these are estimate so i'm not even sure that this is right right now i just i'm just reporting what's happening i do know that there are some factors at play here that that did drive these things on the production side of things at the very least one uh the chinese new year uh, that always affects uh deliveries for tesla affects production and deliveries uh, so this is no exception this year and but but that's still same thing happened in q1 2023 obviously um then the other thing is obviously that the more like uh exceptional thing is the arson attack that we talked about last week in gigafactory berlin um they did restart production this week uh, on Monday or Tuesday, something like that. Uh, it was basically just over a week of production shutdown. We know that Tesla was between five and 6,000 units a week of production for the Model Y. So, so, but it's probably a bigger effect than that because obviously when you restart production, you don't restart right away at uh, five or 6,000 units. It takes some time. And um, that's probably what happening. what's happening here. So yeah, 
people are accounting for that. There's also some on the demand side is there's issues, but at the same time, Tesla has always been able to just adjust pricing and uh, match their production. So it might be more of a production side of things. Then there's the Cybertruck. It's a wild card, but I cannot. I don't, I don't even think Cybertruck can compensate for the the Gigafactory Berlin, right? Oh, for sure not. I mean, the the numbers are so low there, and also, uh, you know, margins at the beginning of production aren't aren't typically that great. Yeah, margin <laughs> is one thing. Margin that's going to be the earnings next month. Um, right. But uh, and I think now people are more looking at like the delivery numbers, the numbers. production numbers coming out the uh, uh, first week of April, um, which Cybertruck is going to help a little bit, but we don't even know how much. So yeah, it, it's something to look at. Uh, if anything, it might even be like a good thing for Tesla shareholders at this point because lowering expectation. If Tesla can beat that, it's it's going to be a good story for the stock, uh, which needs good stories these days. Uh, but uh, yeah, something to keep an eye on here because that not looking good right now, production wise, delivery wise. Will Will Elon be happy if it's four hundred twenty thousand deliveries? 420,000 would still be below these very low estimates. So I, I don't but, know. But uh, I, I, I'm so I'm so getting tired and sick. I didn't even get your joke there. Uh, a little weed joke from Seth. Uh, Tesla goes, all right. So this is something that we've been reporting on uh, before the delivery started with the Cybertruck. Tesla, uh, in the, its contract, when you switch your reservation to an order, in your order agreement, they call it, um, there's been a warning that Tesla was going to go after you if you decided to resell your vehicle. And the warning was quite severe. They talked about like 50, uh, suing you for up to $50,000, which I'm most legal expert don't believe this is going to be um, something enforceable. But they say that they also might blacklist, blacklist you, so they won't sell you any other car after that. Uh, so that's more enforceable because obviously... Tesla can do whatever they want. They can sell their cars to people or not to other people. That's their own decision. Although um, that is that is weird. To I don't <laughs> think Chevy or Ford is not selling to certain people. Well, Ford Ford did do it for the GT, uh, for the Ford GT. Oh yeah, there was that one story, something about yeah. Yeah, John Cena like uh, did it, and uh, he went after John Cena, and he had to apologize and everything. Uh, <laughs> so there is a night, but but that's like okay. The the GT is a low volume vehicle. Uh, the Cybertruck it will not be. It is like right now, but it will not be. It will be a high volume vehicle, so it it will not be a collector item like the the GT is. Um, so, but I guess there's more demand right now because the limit the production is limited. Uh, so there is an opportunity to make some money for people that want it uh, quicker, and. Um, and yeah, uh, it, it's been working. We reported last week on someone selling it for two hundred forty-four thousand, and and that was two hundred forty-four thousand, which was already like more than twice the price of the truck. That was for a dealer's auction, so that means that a dealer bought it, and then the dealer is now trying to resell it. So I think it's an Orlando Porsche dealer that's trying to resell that now for more than two hundred forty-four thousand. I think they they listed it for like two hundred seventy thousand. They're trying to make like forty thousand dollars, thirty thousand dollars out of this. Um, there's one right now on Dog uh, Demero's uh, website, Cars and Bids. Cars and Bids, yeah. Yeah. On Doug's website, uh, they started a listing at like $115,000, something like that. It's already going up. So people are, are doing it. And uh, one of the person who did it, and actually that guy, <laughs> that guy didn't even sell his truck. He just listed it. Uh, so he hasn't sold yet, but uh, Tesla saw it on the, on the auction website. And uh, they saw his VIN number, and they saw that he had other Cybertruck on reservation, and they cancel his other uh, Cybertruck reservation. And they told him that uh, they reimbursed him the hundred dollars per reservation on his two other reservation. But they told him that if he if he tried to reserve again, they will take that money. Then they, they won't deliver the truck. <laughs> Crazy, which is pretty wild. Um, I saw one. Uh, I saw the, the the chief engineer of the Cybertruck on Twitter kind of give an explanation for that, saying that uh, they want to make the trucks for people that enjoy it and not for people that makes money off of it, which I get. I I, I get it. Um, but at this point, it's like it's I, you can't. I would be worried if the production would be super limited, just like the GT, if you're like making a life Ferrari or something like that. I, I understand at that level because 
you you might be taking it away from someone else that did put a reservation and couldn't get in in the production but now everyone that wants a cyber truck will be able to get a cyber truck at some point like in, in the next year or two like also, like, what happens if you have like a you know family emergency or something, and you need the money? Like, you should be able to sell something that you bought. Like, excellent point. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. There, there has to be like legitimate reason. Of course, that now you can say, okay, yeah, but it's con it's convenient that you're you're now making money off of that transaction right. rather than just reselling right. it. But at the same time, you're not not sell it for what the market is buying it right now. Yeah, um, I mean, there's a lot of rabbit holes you can go down there, but. You you had a theory on like oh maybe Tesla doesn't want like other automakers because a lot some people that are buying that are other automakers other yeah didn't didn't firms. Ford buy one of those or something yeah Ford bought one but I think what kills that theory on that front is like Elon said yeah they, that's a good move from Ford to buy it so unless he's saying it's a good move but he would try to prevent it at the same time I don't know I'm not in his head and I don't want to be but <laughs> uh, uh, it uh, it it does it, it's a good theory at least yeah. All right. Speaking of getting the Cybertruck sooner, Tesla launched a new program. Uh, if you're a long-term Tesla shareholder, you can get the Cybertruck sooner. Um, again, we, we've been saying that for a while now. I mean, past Model S, there's not really been a real reason to reserve the Cybertruck early uh, or to reserve any Tesla vehicle early. The the it, it works a little bit. Maybe if you're in California or in our Texas, Maybe it makes more sense. Maybe you'll be able to to be one of the first to get it. But if you're anywhere else, like there's always other things that get at play. And obviously, a lot of people have been saying, "Oh yeah, like there's no other way to get the the, the Cybertruck early than if you uh, um, had the first day reservation or whatever." But we've seen like Justin Bieber, Lady Gaga, Kim Kardashian get it. I mean, unless they are all buying it off of other people, <laughs> or they were all first day reservation holder, which <laughs> I doubt. Uh, I think there might be some things going on. But anyway, now if you are an if okay, so let me get into the exact details here, so I'm not talking out of my bottom. Uh, so you need to okay reservation holder before March 2024. So makes no sense. Okay, <laughs> there there's literally five years of reservation before that um not taking delivery yet okay obviously each person member that uh, provide the brokerage statement showing that you own tesla shares on february 28 2021 so you have to have been owning tesla share for three years and you have to have been on at least 500 shares as of february 29 2024 so you significant see, yeah you need you, need, you cannot be like you be a, a, a few shares like you have to be like at least a significant investment in Tesla. Significant investment for the average person, obviously. Um, so yeah, this is that you can speculate on what that means. That might be Tesla really wanting to um, to 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 give a gift, well, or give a, like a, an advantage to their shareholders to thank their shareholders. Um, but at the same time, it's weird because then you get ahead. Like you can have reserve a cyber truck earlier this month and get a faster delivery than someone that reserved it first day. So that's, that's a weird one. Cause there's still people that reserve first day that haven't have the opportunity to convert the reservation in on order. I'm just, I'm just saying. So it has brought in the uh, theory that Tesla might be having some issues converting reservation into orders, uh, which is a fair theory. When you take into account the fact that Tesla is selling only right now, uh, 100,000 and 120,000 version of the truck, uh, founder series, full packages, a lot less yeah. range on than people were anticipating, twice the price that people were anticipating. Yeah, there's a lot of things that could have negatively affected them on that front. I don't think I would, I wouldn't like this. Let's supposedly had for sure has over 1 million reservation, supposedly had close to 2 million, uh, if not more than 2 million. So I wouldn't have think that it would be a problem at this stage, but sounds like a lot of people at least don't want to pay that that kind of money for the Cybertruck. So Jan Smith just did the math. 500 shares right now at 163 because the, the stock just took a beating this week too. Uh, it's $81,000. So it's not too bad, but it's 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 less than the cost of Cybertruck. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that when this came out though, it was closer to 200. So that'd be 100,000. Yeah. But yeah, anyway. At least, at least closer to 190 at least. Right. Yeah. 
All right, this is something I just posted today after I was uh, perusing Tesla's career page section. I saw this. Uh, it looks like uh, Tesla is really going after Elon's concept of no service is the best service. Uh, this is something that Elon has been saying for a while that, uh, you know, especially was saying it amid Tesla having some more serious service capacity issues, especially in 2021, 2022, Tesla was growing at an insane pace and its uh, service infrastructure was not growing as fast. This has calmed down a bit because during these years, Tesla has invested in Valiant service, growing its mobile fleet like crazy, uh, increasing the capacity of the fleet to cover more service issues and uh, also adding service centers, capacity service centers, building bigger centers with those stations that can handle specific issues faster. Been a lot of improvement that front. I've been hearing a lot less from Tesla owners saying that they have uh, issues getting serviced, though uh, Though there's still a, a specific issues that specific regions uh, where you can see some decent wait times. But the full, full, also Tesla's growth has slowed down last year, let's be honest, and that also helped uh, catching up the service mm -hmm. capacity. Uh, but now Tesla is addressing this issue specifically with a new hire. They're looking for a senior manager for a new program called Zero Service. And in that program, Tesla specifically says that the new job is going to be to identify and eliminate the reasons for the cars to need service. Um, at Tesla, we believe that the best service is no service. We're looking for a highly motivated senior manager to join our service operation organization and lead the team responsible. So it's a new team that they're building here to identify and eliminate the reason for our cars to require service. So theoretically, it could be no service, Tesla service. Like we fire all Tesla technician in the future. I'm kidding, obviously. <laughs> um, even like even if you really make your car like as reliable as possible, there's always going to be a need for service to some degree. Uh, so I don't like uh, I saw someone posted my article on Reddit and uh, like uh, a Tesla technician like posted is like, oh, shit, my 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 issue <laughs> my pro is my job uh, at risk here is like I don't I don't think that Tesla's current size of service capacity is going to ever be reduced. Like Tesla's fleet continue to grow, continue to age, obviously. So even if like this team does its job like perfectly, <laughs> I still think that this this service capacity is going to grow a little bit at the very least it will never shrink in my opinion uh but still an interesting new in, uh, initiative from tesla with a brand new team that's going to try to uh, make the cars more reliable quality control i assume is going to be involved interesting stuff all right um this was a big news. This came out actually just um, after last week's podcast because we did it a little bit early when I was in, in Greece. So it's a week old news, but we're still going to discuss because we didn't do it in the podcast. It's a pretty cool image. Seth. I, this, I did that with my girlfriend on uh, uh, Mid Journey. Uh, nice. I, I didn't know I didn't know what image to use for like a, a cable extension on the because it doesn't exist. So I we we did we asked on Mid Journey and they they did like a long Tesla cable supercharger. It's pretty. I was gonna say the Model S looks pretty weird. Yeah, uh, yeah, they don't like even like you do like the, the Tesla. They cannot do like full like straight on Tesla logo. Like they they always have to modify a little bit. They cannot right. do it perfect. So even the Tesla logo is a little bit different. I think the inverse. Yeah, the inverse two letters. But still, like it's exactly what I wanted. Like it's a long <laughs> supercharger cable. Because Tesla did confirm that they were making a NAX to NAX extension cable. So in the page where Tesla explained what you do if you are charging a non-Tesla vehicle at the supercharger station and you cannot reach the charge port while parked normally, Tesla shows this, this little graphic here. Does you not to go like this, not to go perpendicular but uh to go parallel to the line but to straddle the line basically going a little bit over it is it's a controversial issue but like this let's believe this, this is the best solution right now though it did note in the same page now that we are working on a nax to nax extension cable which will be available for purchase in the future no timeline offered so i don't know what to think about that obviously this sounds like this problem solved extension cable you can you can have the charge port on the whole other side. It, it will work. However, you need to purchase it. So now, now you need to bet on the fact that someone will prefer to pay money to get an extension cable than to be the asshole that parks, that blocks another stall at the supercharger station, which I'm sure some people will. 
Not many. Not many as my, especially at the price. It's not going to be cheap. Like, I don't even know how they're going to do it exactly. Like with the liquid cool and the cable. Yeah, that's, that. that's my question. Like yeah. there's, those cables are really either, they're either really thick or they have the, the cooling liquid going through them, which you can't do with a an extension cord. Maybe so a lower capacity. Uh, right, cut maybe, it down to maybe a thicker a thicker cable at that level to 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 transfer the the, the capacity, but I, I don't know. Uh, but it, it does make sense that Tesla has this product at the very least. Yeah. Um, but maybe something more like a, a, there has to be a solution to have it at the charger, and you can just unlock it, put it back. Maybe link to the credit card, so if you don't put it back, like you could be charged for it. I I don't know. Like there has to be like a better solution than have everyone buy it because. Mm-hmm. It's not a great buy because you probably don't need it that often. It's probably going to be expensive. I don't know. It's not a perfect solution, but I think the product should exist. Either that or they should make a couple longer cables at every station kind of reserved for that. Yeah, do some retrofit basically on the existing V3. I mean, the Cybertruck, like you have to pull that thing in pretty tight to charge it by itself. So maybe they should be, you know, making their cables longer. Yeah. Already, yeah, it, it would make sense. They're already producing those cables for V4. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm talking. Uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. And the V4 cables are not retrofitable on V3s. I don't know. But uh, it, it, you could just put the V4 cable on the V3 if that's possible. Problem solved. Maybe it's a big investment, obviously, but uh, it will help. All right. Uh, next piece of news like that came out earlier this week, and. Um, uh, this is uh, the, uh, was a big controversial piece of news here that I want to be careful the way I address it because this was one of the most publicized autopilot crash, fatal autopilot crash ever. One of the first one, too. Um, there was the one in Florida before that, obviously. That was very tragic, too, with the, the truck. Uh, but this one was a, uh, a little bit even more controversial because the autopilot clearly like did something wrong, uh, but the driver was also doing something wrong at the same time. Um, and now this case is finally going to trial. And this is the third trial in a row going, a third uh, wrongful death trial in a row going to trial in, in, in California uh, after Tesla won the last two. So, you know, logic would tell you that Tesla is going to be winning this one too. But and you have to take into account that the lawyers this time have the benefit of having learned from the last two trial and they're taking a different approach. And this crash happened in 2018. So the discovery process and all that has been going a long time. So for those who don't remember, this is the the, the fatal accident of, uh, sorry, I forget his name. I think it's Walter. Uh, well, yeah, Walter Yuan. Uh, he was an Apple engineer. And um, the, uh, the accident happened on the highway, I think on the left lane, and the autopilot screwed up and went into the median. Uh, in an inter- in a, in an exit, and he crashed his Model X into a crash um, accentuator. No, uh, that's not that. That would be making the crash worse. No. What yeah, but they, they, I, if I recall correctly, there was a crash was there. Yeah, yeah, there was a crash like a week before, and yeah. But how, what, what do you crash? Attenuator. Yeah, that's that's a better word. So there used to be a crash attenuator on the median at the barrier, and it was not there. So it crashed straight into the barrier or the, the remains of the uh, crash attenuator that used to be there for the crash. Uh, he, he died, unfortunately, of his um, injuries a few hours later at the hospital. So clearly, the autopilot like did a mistake. You don't go into the median. Makes no sense. Bad. But you cannot automatically put the blame on it because Tesla says that you need to be paying attention and there is clear evidence that he was not paying attention. Was he playing a video game or watching uh, a video? There was evidence that he was on his phone. I don't remember if it was a video game or not, but they, the, the, the phone logs did show that he was on his phone, so obviously not paying attention. But even then, I think there was like three or four seconds between going into the median and the crash. Which obviously, if you're paying attention, three and four seconds is plenty of time to adjust. Like, especially mm-hmm. if you're like on the left lane going into the crash, it makes no sense. You could just go back into your lane. It's, it makes no sense. Uh, so, this, like, because I, Tesla fans sometimes they just they go crazy on that stuff. They just like screw the guy, screw the guy's family. They just have their money and all that. They wasn't paying attention. It's his fault. 
no one is disputing that. Not even um, the the lawyers here in this case. They're not disputing that. That's what's interesting about this case. This case is taking a different approach where they are focusing on Tesla, one, knowing that there was a problem with autopilot um, uh, doing that, the median, which I think that's not even in dispute. Like uh, I remember... Yeah, you remember the early days of autopilot set, like the autopilot would often uh, take exit that didn't exist or, or, or whatnot. So it's that's a common issue. But the more interesting part of it is that the, the case is focusing also on Tesla uh, basically influencing the overconfidence of drivers, making it so that they would not pay attention. Um and this is a controversial issue by itself. I'm the first going to admit that because, like, you cannot dump proof everything to the point that everyone is, like, going to be safe. Like, everyone's going to abuse the system. So can Tesla really be responsible for someone abusing the system? However, legal experts are saying that Tesla did have a responsibility to look into the, the foreseeable abuse of the system and address that. And... Based on the discovery of this case, it does uh, the, the 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 plaintiff do claim to have evidence that Tesla did not do that, did not look into the foreseeable abuse of the system. Now, I'm not a legal expert, so I'm I'm saying like I, I don't know if there's really a case there. If you can say that if you don't look into that, then you're you're liable. I don't know that. I'm just saying it's an interesting case because we do know that there is a level of issues with people being overconfident with Tesla's ADAS system. That's, I, I, I think everyone can admit that to a degree. Like some people get overconfident in the system. To what degree is Tesla responsible for that? Obviously, like Elon's comments are a big thing on that. And that's what the last time we reported on this case, actually, I don't know if you remember this said it was last year uh, as part of the discovery process, which it was insane. Tesla's lawyer, so the, the plaintiff lawyers said that uh, they, they brought up a bunch of Elon's statement about full self-driving, about autopilot at the time, as example of why uh, Tesla owners could become overconfident in the system. And uh, Tesla's response to that, it was like, we cannot even know for sure that these comments were from Elon because they could have been deep fake. That was amazing. Yeah, which is an insane thing to do. Like, first of all, like they didn't even point out, like, this is deep fake. This is not deep fake. Like, uh, like we know that Elon has said some plenty of things about full self driving that have been over that that could induce overconfidence in people, uh, and I don't think there was ever any allegation that those were deep fakes. Like, why would you bring that up at the time of a trial? It's 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 so weird. Or at the discovery before a trial. Now there's still some issue with this trial. It's uh, uh, I think it's next week that they're gonna start uh, figuring out what evidence they can show to the the jury. So. That's going to be the whole deal, basically, like depending on what they can show. Because uh, the other interesting thing that came out this week with this trial is uh, an email from John McNeil, who you might remember as uh, Tesla's uh, first president. I think it was first president. A um, long time ago. Yeah, a while ago. So before this crash, I think that was in 2016, he sent an email to Elon and Sterling Anderson, who was the head of Autopilot at the time. He sent an email saying, I got so comfortable on the autopilot that I ended up blowing by exit because I was immersed in emails or calls. And then in quotes, says, I know, I know it's not recommended use. So basically, it shows that even Tesla's own employees are abusing, or its own executive are abusing the system. So it shows that Tesla knew that people could abuse the system. Now, what are they doing to remedy that? And that's going to be the, I think, the, the juice of the of this case here. And they're going to obviously focus on a few things like Tesla's lack of driver monitoring at the time. Um, the fact that they didn't launch the ca cabin facing camera driver monitoring until 2021, three years after this accident. Um, maybe they will, they can use also the, um, the recall that happened last year in December uh, that also focused on driver alerts. So, you could argue that uh, now that Tesla had to improve the driver alerts uh, to tell them to pay attention, uh, and that was not there in 2018, that could probably that could maybe be a point. I don't even know. It, what I found interesting in this case again is that it's going to focus on does Tesla have a role to play in 
autopilot user, full self-driving user being overconfident in Tesla system. I think that's there's it's worth at least discussing, at least, I think. That, yeah, I mean, it, you know, every word that comes out of Elon's mouth is basically like full self-driving is a miracle, like, you know, that we have yeah. uh, lots of retweets of people who are driving, uh, you know, without their hands and and that kind of stuff. So I, I think that there's a case to be made, but I don't know. I mean, I kind of feel like the Tesla should just go, look, this is not full self-driving. This is, you know, a an assist and you have to keep your hand on the wheel and you have to look forward. And that's what this is. And we don't know when the next thing is going to come out. But we already sold it to you. <laughs> yeah. And but you bought it like three years ago. So, you know, so all of these things, they play a little bit of factor, which is, I think it's worth discussing at least. All right, Tesla India. That happened today. Tesla India might finally be happening. Um, if you've been following this whole saga, like this is interesting because India is the biggest market in which, biggest auto market in which Tesla is not operating yet. And the reason for that is that Tesla wants to do what it always do when it enters a new market, is just first the import vehicles from their other factories, their foreign factories, and establish a ser service infrastructure, sales infrastructure, supercharger infrastructure, uh, start building a market there. And then obviously, if the market is big enough, they start manufacturing there like they did in China, like they did in Europe. But India... Uh, Want Tesla to start with that, and Tesla couldn't really, and Tesla couldn't just bypass that because they have significant import duties for new vehicles in, in India. So Tesla wanted them to reduce their import duties or waive them completely before um, they establish a factory in the country, so that they could do, they can build up the market and then do the factory. So they, for the last three years, basically they've been going back and forth, trying to find a compromise, and it didn't, it wasn't never happened though last year it looks like it was getting closer when elon met with the prime minister modi in the us right after the meeting Elon says that tesla would make an investment in india as soon as humanly possible so that was a few months ago and today the news is that the government uh released a new scheme uh, they call it to um accelerate uh manufacturing ev manufacturing investment in the country so basically the scheme Reduce the import duties to 15%, a much more reasonable rate for EVs valued at more than $35,000 for five years. But there are three main requirements to get access to that deal. Uh, one, you need to make an investment of a minimum of the equivalent of 500 million US. Two, you make a commitment to build a factory in, in, in an EV factory in India, and you need to get to production within three years. At that three years level, that commitment is a 25% localization of parts. So it's not too bad. So, But you need to ramp that up to 50% in five years, within the five years, which is, again, the five years that you get to also sell your vehicles at the 15% import duties. Finally, there's a limit on those vehicles being imported to 40,000 total, 8,000 units per year. So not the greatest deal in the world, but a decent compromise. Like now, basically, Tesla could build a service center or multiple service centers in the country, start building a supercharger network, start selling cars, Model 3 and Model Ys, up to 8000 a year while they make their investment into building a factory slowly uh, so, that the, so that by the time that the factory is starting to, to go into production, they already have a local presence, a local market build up uh, from uh, their vehicle importation. Makes sense to me. Yeah, the numbers are just low, like eight thousand a year yeah. for five years. That's quite not a ton of cars. Although maybe the, maybe they focus on the high end at the beginning and you know sell some Model S's and X's import wise. It's got to be above 30 k. Yeah, thirty five thousand. But what I've been seeing from Tesla's most recent market launches, sometimes most of the time they launch multi, the open orders from all Model Y. They don't even open orders from all S and X, especially in the those uh, market that have a lower GDP per capita, like the Southeast Asia market and all that. Yeah, uh, Malaysia recently, Thailand recently, and all that. So I don't know. I would imagine they would launch the or they would start building. The model two or whatever we're calling the low cost 
Tesla. Uh, there yeah, as well. that, that actually, yeah, there was a news that came out of that a few months ago that uh, um, the the deal that because Tesla has so obviously the announcement this week is not about Tesla specifically. It opens the door to Tesla, but it is rumored that Tesla negotiated that deal with the government because there have been a bunch of rumors that Tesla has been negotiating with the government. And most recently, they said that the factory that they plan to make that uh, in India would be for the next gen cheaper vehicle, which would make sense in the Indian market that. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't buy that many expensive vehicles there. Well, we buy quite a few because, I mean, there's over like 1.6 billion people there or something. It's I think it's 1.4, but it, yeah. 1.4, yeah, crazy. All right, moving on from Tesla news, uh, we have a four, uh, four, five more news items to discuss, and then we're going to jump into the comment section. So if you guys have any questions for us, you can put them in the comment section right now when I get to it in a few minutes. It can be about things that we discussed today or other topics in the EV world that we want us to address. Get, get to it in about well, 15 minutes, maybe. The Polestar 3 um, was um, had a, a variant to it, a cheaper variant this week. So when officially launching, the price was starting at uh, $83,000 US. And um, now you have a new variant with... Uh, okay. Um, the long range dual motor with pilot pack 100. Okay, pilot pack. Okay, the pack is not the battery here because all the batteries are 111 kilowatt hour. Um, so the new base one basically, uh, with um, you yeah, know, I, I have issues seeing the difference here with uh, <laughs> the first two are basically exactly the same. Spec wise here, yeah. Spec wise, they're exactly the same. Uh, but you, ha you have a new version starting at seventy three thousand uh, dollars, and uh, so you get like you get the plus pack in the second one, which yeah, is probably... which I don't know exactly. Maybe but maybe it's, it's probably... like interior features or, or, right. or whatever, uh, because you get three hundred fifteen miles of range, which is great. Uh, you get uh, two hundred fifty kilowatt charging, all wheel drive, four hundred eighty nine horsepower, zero to sixty is five seconds. Just like the plus pack, which started at basically seventy nine thousand dollars, and then you have the long range motor pilot pack and performance pack, which uh, gives you a little bit more horsepower for four point seven seconds zero to sixty. You do lose a few miles of range with that performance at two hundred seventy nine. That now starts at seventy nine thousand four hundred, uh, so right below the limit for SUVs to get the on the ball. That be well, yeah, that will be produced in the U.S. right. Uh, uh yeah that's the same eventually. plant that yeah. south carolina one that uh builds the volvo ex90 mm -hmm. and then finally you have the long range dual motor with pilot plus and performance pack okay so i need to look into what their pack things are uh that is the most expensive one at eighty five thousand dollars. and what do you get with that uh, a little bit faster a little bit more oh the uh the extra yeah, okay, so you get so the, the pilot pack is lane change assist, park assist, and a heads up display. Um, the pilot and performance are great. 25 speaker audio system designed explicitly by uh, Bowers and Wilkins with uh, Polestar. Okay, so it's all basically just luxury packages inside. But yeah, uh, 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 Cheaper price of the Polestar 2, which makes sense. Uh, it was it was quite expensive uh, at eighty three thousand dollars starting price. It's still pretty expensive. Yeah, for not having a third row. Yeah. Uh, Volkswagen gave us a date for the production of its ID One. It's a uh, upcoming cheap twenty thousand euros uh, electric vehicle that's coming. And was the ID Life? It had, it had a bunch of different names before. Um, that thing is not coming soon. <laughs> they revealed this week at a press conference that it's coming in 2027. So don't hold your breath for it. Like uh, it's uh, it's gonna arrive around the same time, baseball well, a little bit later even than Tesla's uh, next gen vehicle. Though the volume production of, the, of that vehicle is probably gonna be around that same time, 2027. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, a bit of a bummer, but. Uh, did, did did they even commit to uh US market for that? Uh I don't think they have yet. Yeah. Uh we did hear that the uh the uh 
what is it called? The GTI version of the ID. Yeah, that they are interested in the US, yeah. Which I really think they need to do. It would be it'd be so nice to have a, a hot hatch. Uh although Rivian's got one coming as well. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, bad news or or not, if you believe Fisker. Um, uh, so last week when we left it off with Fisker, the uh, they were in big doo doo financially and everything, but they were saying that they were talking to a large automaker for an investment for a partnership. They were being vague. Then later there was a Reuters report that it might have been Nissan. Now, if you've been following Nissan news this week, Nissan has been all over the place talking about partnership with this, partnership with that. And Fisker's name never came up, but uh, today they are partner. They announce a strategic partnership with Honda. It's not they don't even announce a, like a electric vehicle together or anything like that, but more like charging and research and development and all that. They're gonna work together on that. So I don't know if it's good or not for for Fisker, but it didn't help the stock uh, this week. Though what happened yesterday, or uh, uh, yeah, uh, March 15, yeah, 14, uh, there was a report that Fisker hired a firm uh, to help them uh, navigate bankruptcy. So there's rumor that they're going to file for bankruptcy. And then uh, a few hours later, Fisker released a statement in response, and their statement is, uh, as a matter of a company policy, Fisker does not comment on market rumors and speculation. However... <laughs> <laughs> Fisker often works with outside advisor, so that talking about the advisor yeah, to help manage its business and assist in developing and executing strategies. Strategies about bankruptcy. Uh, <laughs> Fisker is focused on raising additional capital, so that's that's the little denial of the of the because the, the the first part is like they're saying we don't comment on this, and then they're like sort of like not even denying it. This is a little bit more of a denial. Fisker is focused on raising additional capital and engaging in a strategic partnership with a large automaker. Uh, the company is also continuing to pursue its shift to a dealership partnership model, which uh, that won't save them. In both North America and Europe, the leadership team is laser focused on these efforts, even though Enric Fisker has been MIA for like a few weeks now. Uh, it's just been like a running guy in the Fisker community. It's like, where is, where is Enric? Like, no one's seen Enric. Yeah, uh, this is not looking good. Like everyone is laughing, like they're saying, like MKBHD killed uh, Fisker. I I don't know about that. I think Fisker killed Fisker. Uh, it didn't help for sure. Like especially, especially like MKBHD. If you're a fan of his, like you you, you follow his style, he, he doesn't really report on products that he don't like normally. Like he if he, if he posts a video, it's because there's he likes it. There's value. Doesn't he doesn't uh, review that many vehicles. Uh, also so when he does it's again because they find something very interesting on it and uh and this one like he didn't say anything that other people haven't said about the fisker before like they have some major issues with the ocean and he just highlighted those so i think it's more like obviously he has a massive reach so i highlighted that a lot he is extremely credible as a reviewer for especially our generation i think so maybe that that actually resulted in a lot of cancellation i don't know but don't, don't put the entire bankruptcy of this girl on, on mkdvg's back i think it was trending that way way before you ever touched the ocean um in fact i would say <clears throat> many of the points that he brought up the software you know was kind of messy um so. our own yeah our own jamie uh dow had kind of brought the, brought those to light yeah. a little bit earlier he wasn't as uh like i think the title of the video was like this may be the worst car i reviewed ever or something i don't think jamie was yeah, as the, the title was worse than the video the video was like right. way more like well, the guy is always very nuanced and everything in any way but the, the title the title hurt more than anything i think right but yeah actually the stock kind of bounced back from that a little bit from that the the note even though like i don't i don't understand how anyone is believing fisker at this point honestly like like it, it went down 52 percent when the report of the hiring of uh, an adver advisor for bankruptcy and then it was up 42 percent after the that that announcement that response from fisker which, which is know. crazy because that's a non that's a non-denial denial sort of yeah 
and uh, and especially like I think that the biggest thing that like kind of gave Fisker investors some hope would be like the Nissan rumor last week. Right. But I would I would downgrade that rumor this week with Nissan announcing the Honda partnership and uh, saying that they would work with Sony too and all that. Like how many companies Nissan needs to work with? Like <laughs> like it's uh I don't and and how much value is there in in Fisk and working with Fisker in the first place? Uh. Again, like Fisker is super cheap right now. I understand, like, and if you want to buy it, you're gonna have to buy it at a premium, <coughs> I, I would assume. But they, again, I, I'm saying they come with a, a billion dollar convertible note or whatever. I don't I remember. I don't remember the exact uh, uh, cost. So, like, you you need to take over their debt too. And uh, is it really worth that? I don't know. Well, no, I, I know it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Quote me on that. Actually, yeah, it's not. Uh, it's not worth. It. Yeah. All right, Waymo. Uh, Waymo is making some stride. They uh, announced this week that they are starting their uh, their service uh, with their app uh, fully automated uh, rides in LA of all places. So now you can uh, be uh, stuck in traffic in a Waymo instead of your own car, which is nice. And uh, they also confirmed that they're going to open in Austin, Texas, by the end of this year. So now, um, so now it's what it's SF, Phoenix, LA. Um, do they have any other market? Uh, so the LA service area is going to be Santa Monica, Century City, K Town, Downtown, parts of West Hollywood. So just parts of it. Okay. Beverly Hills, Culver City. Um, yeah, that's a that's a lot. That's a big part of the city. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, there's plenty of uh, Ubers needed in LA. LA. LA is obviously a big driving town, so. Uh, That'll go well. I, I think it's also interesting that uh, Waymo is not now operating or will soon operate in Austin. So, you know, Tesla Tesla workers can get a ride to work in a Waymo. Uh, so. A real full self-driving drive where they don't have to pay attention. Right. They still use the iPace uh, Waymo? Is it the primary yeah. vehicle they still use? Yeah, yeah iPace, iPace. And then they, they had those... Uh, um, Hybrids, the uh, Pacifica hybrids for a while. Yeah, but I think it's mostly I Pace, which is crazy because yeah. <laughs> they had a weird choice of their of their cars, right? The, like two vehicles that kind of like didn't didn't really pick pick up in the EV space, like the Pacifica and the. But they have a new also had battery recalls too. <laughs> they have a new one, uh, a Zeker. Uh, you know the Chinese brand owned by Geely. Oh, I think. really? They, they have a new that. and it and that's kind of like a minivan. It's a little bit bigger. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be better. I think that holds like six or seven people. Yeah, I really. Google is weird. I mean, do you remember the, the original Google self-driving car? So it's not too much. Of a yeah, they were like weird, like mini bug. You know, the predate that uh, the Google's car predate the micro Lino kind of a kind of. Oh, like, yeah, that's true. It was kind of uh, it was bigger than that, obviously, but still the same kind of shape a little bit. All right, this uh, company that you like a lot, Span, the uh, the unveil a whole new lineup of um, of their electrical panel this week. What do you find interesting about that, Seth? Yeah, so Span, uh, they make uh, the electrical panels that everybody has in their house, like the main panel, uh, but it's smart. So um, you can tell it like, hey, if I'm getting too much power, turn off this this breaker and turn off this breaker and you know turn on this breaker only at night and you know you can do all kinds of stuff like that there's 32 in the one that is kind of being sold now they just announced a 48 uh panel 48 breaker panel and then two smaller panels i think a 16 and a 24. they also have one with a, a meter built in so uh the uh utility they're working with the utilities directly so utilities will come out and send these so what's good about that so a lot of people have like, uh, you know, 80 amp service coming out to their house and they're electrifying. They're getting electric vehicles. They're getting, um, you know, heat pumps installed, which take a lot of electricity and they're getting rid of the oil uh, heat or the gas heat. Um, and, you know, theoretically, they're getting electric ovens and they're getting, you know, electric dryers and whatever. Um, so this is a problem. And this is actually a problem that I have. Um, I have a 200 amp service. But, you know, with the multiple electric vehicles, with uh, the heat pumps that we put in, um, I'm bumping up against my 200 amp uh, limit. Uh, not that I'm using 200 amps at the same time. It's just I have so many different electrical items um, that uh, we're hitting the, the limit. So 
you know, I did some research on this. Um, I I've known about span for a long time. Uh, I was like, all right, I need to get this because my electrician is telling me like, instead of getting a second or third EV charger, I, I have to go off of one. And I was using a Neo charge, which is kind of a splitter for a while, mm-hmm. but, um, I would rather have three different, um, chargers and I want them to be 48 amp instead of 32 amp. Uh, so I want the most amperage I can get. Well, with the span, um, I can say, Hey, um, turn off my car chargers. If you know, I'm starting to get up close to the 200 amp limit that way, I don't need another 200 amp, um, cable coming into my house, which, you know, our, our cables are buried and it's, you know, far from the street. So you need a trencher and it it was going to end up being like 10 or $20,000. I'm not surprised. Um, I mean, that's quite a bit of money. And, you know, the span thing is, uh, I think they're 3,500 now, and there's a federal tax credit of, I think, 600. So it's down to $2,900, which is, you know, still a lot more than a regular panel, but you get all these, you know, incentives. And, you know, theoretically, you can tell, you know, your car charging breaker to only come on during, you know, electric, when, when electric's cheap. And of course, you can do that from the car and you can do it from the, a lot of chargers. But this is like all in one place. So you can kind of control everything from an app. And um, it's also good that you can see like, hey, what is using all the electricity in this house right now? You can um, adjust. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, if you have like an air conditioning in your attic that's going and you're like, why is the air conditioning in the attic going right now? Just turn it off um, at the breaker. So it's kind of nice that you can control the whole house from anywhere in the world. Um, you see where your solar is coming in. It controls the batteries. One, one kind of neat thing that it does, um, and we've heard kind of rumors that Tesla is going to be working with Span and, and the CEO is a, the old head of Tesla Energy. But um, what you could do is like if you are using more than 200 amps, um, co- you know, coming out from your uh, line from the street, you can uh, invoke the uh, Tesla Powerwall to send electricity in, mm. in addition to what's coming out. So. Um, it allows you to control a little bit more the batteries and the solar and, and what's what's happening on your your home network. So anyway, I'm getting one of these. I'm getting it installed like in the next couple of weeks, and then I'm going to do a review of it. That's cool. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I kind of need Dacus. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say you would be a I good candidate. A weirdest electrical situation in my house with like two different entries from the electric utilities. One in my garage, one which is a a, a four hundred volt entry, and then I have uh, one, two, three different electrical panel in my my main house on top of the two ones in my garage. This because my house kept getting I, I didn't do it. I bought the house like that, but kept getting add ons to the house, and the guy kept doing it himself and didn't plan the electrical situation very well. So like when I got my power walls installed, it was like so complicated. Like the the, the guys couldn't believe it. Like they kept having to re uh, change the the plans for it because of it. It was it was crazy. Yeah. All, All right. right. Let's, uh, let's go to the comments. All right. Um, a Mark Webb says, "I wonder how much Tesla demand is being hurt by removal of USS radar and stocks, yoke, etc., and Elon's communication style." What do you think? Well, communication style, I can agree with. Uh, US radar stock, I don't know, like the wider public, like the hardcore, definitely think about that. But like, I just talked to my to 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 my uh, Uber driver. Uh, coming from the airport just now you had a 2023 model 3 and the guy was like all in in the island he's like i want the island it's looking super cool and everything and i i asked him like what do you think of the of the stock and things like that i'm like no new wheels look super cool he's like yeah but you know the stalker did like, yeah, he didn't care like <laughs> i think i think the wider public is not that big of a deal on that uh the radar You'd be, I would like to know like the exact take rate of Tesla's like autopilot, uh, enhanced autopilot, and uh, full self driving. Like it's like we talked a lot about full self driving because like we bought it obviously, <laughs> and uh, and this and Elon Musk keeps saying that Tesla is worth nothing without it. Uh, yeah. But the reality of it is like the take rate is pretty low on that thing. Like it's Tesla is not talking about it obviously, but like if it's over 15, 20 percent, it would be. I would be shocked. 
Um, so yeah, I don't think that's a big deal. Elon communication, yeah, because obviously Elon is the face of Tesla, and uh, he's uh, he keeps putting his foot in his mouth, uh, saying some some dumb things. And recently, you excited about this Don Lemon interview uh, Monday? Oh yeah, that's coming out Monday, right? Yeah. Oh my god, yeah, yeah, that was that was another one where. I, I saw some clips. He did not look happy. I don't know why he was yeah. so uh, upset, but yeah, that that was a double whammy for me because, like, one, it's it's dumb to like. Obviously, I know people keep making the, the distinction between canceling the contract and canceling the show. Like, how people he didn't cancel the show; he just canceled his contract with X. Look, at the end of the day, he had a contract with uh, what his face, uh, 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 the former Tucker. Uh, Tucker. Tucker Carlson, you have a contract with Tucker Carlson where he openly amplify Tucker Carlson on X, a conservative voice, obviously. Um, and then his idea was like, we'll take a liberal voice, Don Lemon, and offer him a show, offer him a contract, and amplify him too, so that it's going to be fair. Like, even though you have to trust that they're going to be amplified to the same level, whatever. Okay, it's going to be fair. And then as soon as he, inter he gets an interview for Elon Musk, and Elon Musk is unhappy with it, he canceled that contract. So uh, I know he's still allowed to post on X and everything, but it is there's still a, a balance issue. And even though you can see it's still free speech because he's allowed to do it and everything, at the end of the day, if you know how X works, amplification is is everything. And if you're not amplified, you might as well not be heard at all. Like it's it's it, that's how it works. So it's dumb on, on that where he's being an hypocrite with, with on that front. And it's also dumb that if he didn't want people to see that interview, like that whole thing is gonna make more people watch an interview because first of all, it's not just gonna be on X now; it's gonna be everywhere, and uh, and people are gonna just want to see it because of all the controversy. Yeah, what there. happened? Yeah, and uh, I, some of my friends were like, "Do you think this was done on purpose? Like, do you think Elon's just amplifying the the thing?" And uh, I don't know; I don't uh, think so. No, because now now pe more people are gonna watch it on YouTube and and, and all that. Right. I think, even though I'm sure that. The because the X number is like you just crawl past it and like it gives you a view, just like a Facebook or something. Like it's not like YouTube, so where you have to click on it to get a view. So I'm sure that like the X numbers will still be good, and then Elon will will show that with a screenshot. Like, look, we still got like five million views on X or whatever. So like, don't don't be surprised if that happens. Uh, but um, but yeah, I mean, I think more people are gonna watch that, and apparently he's not happy with it. Like he. I know that you 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 shared with me the Kara Swisher thing. Like she she apparently got a scoop on the Elon side of things. They said the Elon's representative. She got like the text from it, like oh, they can cancel that contract, whatever. Uh, and that yeah. mentioned like it's ketamine use, like that, like as if that was an uh, an important part of the interview that Elon got upset about. So be, be, well, before that, I di I didn't actually believe that much that you had a ketamine problem because. Ketamine problem is like pretty hardcore in my in my head. Like you're not really functional if you have a ketamine problem. I know ketamine is used in therapy now and everything, but it's or in very small doses uh, uh, in a therapeutic environment. But like they're talking about abuse of ketamine, which is pretty hardcore. I never really believed that, but now I'm tempted to believe it more if uh, talking about it really upset Elon in this interview. Yeah, and uh, Matthew Perry, the guy, died recently from it. Oh, from it that was because no, no, no. now if this like if if the, if it started being more serious allegation of drug abuse, this should be a problem. He's the CEO of a public company. He's the CEO of a defense contractor. Like the, if the, I, I again, I didn't believe it until now. I'm, I'm, I still don't believe it for a fact. We need to see the interview, and whatnot. But if if there is something there now, we need to be careful. Yeah, and I think. I think he, they they've alluded to it. Like Elon's alluded to it. He's tweeted out things about ketamine, like being you know for for mm. you know whatever. But I I also think that like he got in trouble uh, for the Joe Rogan smoking weed. So I I can't imagine like I, I think they did a whole review or something on the on SpaceX. Yeah, but so he has that review. I think so. Right, yeah. but he probably doesn't enjoy going through those and. He yeah, probably yeah, yeah. didn't want to get into another one. All right, moving on. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, I have perceived a shift in leadership from Tesla, <clears throat> Tesla to Rivian, not in terms of sales, obviously, but in terms of how North American EV enthusiasts view the market. 
That's true. I, I I would agree with that. I've seen I've seen a lot more people getting excited about Rivian, ex excited as a, as a, a thought leader in in the EV space. No one is gonna doubt that Tesla is still a leader in sales, the leader as a, as a company in terms of size and all that. But uh, I've seen it on X too from Tesla fans attacking X, attacking Rivian like like crazy yes. too. Yep. Uh, which which I mean that that's what I've been saying for a long time. Like I I hate to see it. These hardcore Elon fan are not really Tesla. They're they are Tesla stock fan. They are Elon fans. They are not at electric. You keep saying that we're like these these people keep saying that we are anti Tesla, anti Elon. We're not anti Tesla. We're pro Tesla's mission, which makes up pro Tesla to a degree. Uh, so keep that in mind. These people when they, they trash other EVs like Rivian, like who, why would you trash Rivian? Uh, they're they're not pro Tesla's mission to accelerate the advent of electric vehicles and renewable energy. All right, let's change the background. If if uh, Rivian's now the thought leader, we're going to switch it up for, for us then. All right. Um, I know I that I canceled the Model X order for these reasons. So he's talking about the uh, Elon's communication style, I'm assuming. Or, or the, the lack of uh, radar and stock. Today. Oh, maybe <laughs> so, it was both. The the yoke, it's not, well, the yoke the yoke form is not an excuse because you, you, the, the standard, the round wheel is standard now, but you don't get the stock. That's true. All right, a couple of people have been asking about Mikey G from Quick Charge. Um, I got an email from Mikey uh, about two weeks ago saying he was burnt out and he's going to take a break. Um, so I haven't heard much from him since then, but uh, we have our own Steven um, on uh, the Quick Charge podcast. I think he's doing a great job. Obviously, not you know up to speed quite yet, but um, yeah, give him, give him a chance. Oh, give him a chance. Yeah, give him a chance. If you, and, if you uh, follow us on Instagram, you're already familiar with him. He's posted video on Instagram, but yeah. the quick charge format was really much Mikey, and he's trying to adapt it to his own, so you have to give him a chance. For sure. Yeah, he's great. All right, uh, Mark Webb, it feels to me like Hyundai is taking the lead with products like the EV9. Competitors are starting to offer faster charging rates and longer range, but Tesla doesn't seem to be improving in those areas. Yeah, I mean, the EV9 is not really the same kind of product as a... It's not even a key yeah. on EV9. <laughs> like yeah. it's a eighty thousand dollar, like fully loaded, like it's a it's a big vehicle, of a luxury big vehicle. Like it's, it, it, I, I think it, it started. It, it's nice. It starts it's just, at fifty, I think. Yeah, it started at fifty, but like you can you can, you can load that thing with like it, yeah. it feels like it escalates sometimes, like with all, all the very nice options and everything. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's a great it's a great product. I don't know if it's taking the lead really. Like, uh, let's see how much they sell because, like the, the the Ionic is a like Ionic is a great product. EV6 was a great product, but they uh, they didn't sell like terribly well. Like it's picking up now. So like, let's see if they get some momentum and really get behind it. But the product, I agree, is is great. And also, Hyundai isn't coming out with these like announcements like, hey, we're slowing down production or hey, we're doing this. They're going full steam ahead. So good for them. Yeah. Um, the Model X seems to get worse and worse. I don't know if it gets worse and worse. It probably just yeah. stays where it's at, which is, you know, it's still quite fast, still seven, seven or seven seater sometimes. Uh, so, uh, I love the styling of the Ionic six, but I won't mess with a dealer ever again. That's Ooh. a good point. Dealers are not fun to deal with. Some are okay. Most are not. Yeah. If you have a good one, you're fine. But on average, good luck finding a good one. Yeah. All right, agree. Dealers are big negative. There's our math. Thank yes. you, Ian. Um, Jorg says service capacity seems much too low for actual challenges. Depending where you are, like uh, yeah, I know I can check with my on my phone on me, but check if I want to get a Tesla appointment right now. Uh, I'm actually my Model Y is having a lot of issues lately. Um, really? Now, now our front. Um, wheel is just squeaking like super loud and it's like a known problem and they fixed it in later models but ours didn't hit at until after the warranty so it's going to be like a 600 hundred dollar repair which i'm not really a fan of yeah uh a friend of mine made abysmal experiences swearing to never buy a tesla again which i am sorry about as a tesla owner and investor myself yeah i yeah. mean we've heard some of those but like this is anecdotal okay he's a uh, hamburg germany yeah i'm i'm not that familiar with tesla's 
service capacity and quality in the in Germany. Uh, but uh, I feel for you or for your friend. All right, we have a stock prediction. Medi says Tesla stock is going to tank in April. It's not even going to hit that four twenty number. It's four fifteen, according to our Facebook friend. Yeah, uh, we'll have to see. Uh, Tesla service has been great for me, but I've also never had any serious issues from them. Yeah, same, same. I had only a very few issues with my car, and always had a great service experience. Um, mobile service is awesome. Mobile service is a big game changer. All right, hello to Club Rivian on Facebook. Hi, hello. Uh, I believe the Rivian R2 and R3 will significantly erode demand for the 3 and Y, assuming Rivian can ramp production enough. I mean, we're talking two years, three years yeah. from now. R3, you don't even know when that is. R2 volume production is still several years away. All right. We have a uh, direct at Fred. Come on, Fred. Some people are overconfident crossing the street. Should we sue crosswalk lights for the same reason? That's that's a bad comparison. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Talking it's not about great. Uh, not great. An active driving technology versus like a, a street. Uh, Electric Brian says Tesla needs to call autopilot adaptive cruise control with lane keep assist. I mean, like every other automaker out there. <laughs> yeah. Remind me again of the status of FSD four. All new Teslas have it. Question mark. See Cybertruck. In my opinion, FSD need, needs higher resolution cameras, and it's unclear when they're what they are using today. Well, Cybertruck doesn't have any kind of uh, FSD. Yeah, nothing um, active right now. Uh, yeah. but Tesla did a camera upgrade in the latest generation of uh, the, the sensor suite, uh, which I don't, I don't know. Since then, I haven't heard any expert really hammering on that. I know that the previous one, there might be an argument for it. Uh, so I'm even saying that Tesla will need a retrofit for the cameras that was in the 3.0 uh, sensor suite. But uh, I don't think that's a concern at this point right now for the 4.0. But yeah, in the CT, there's... Like sets in, there's nothing. Well, the, the, the hardware is there. There's no software for it. Right. All right. Scott Carter says, I don't think autopilot is misleading. And the airplane autopilot assists the pilot. You will never want to see your pilot back in the cabin watching a movie to keep the lawyers away. Call it cruise control. Yeah. I mean, we've heard that a lot. Uh, that's the argument that people have been using. I, I, I think it's fair. I'm not I'm not saying you're, you're wrong there. I think it's a combination of the name, of the communication, of Elon's comments. I think the entire thing, like if if you are like like us, if you're a Tesla owner and you have a pilot and you, you get into you, you get someone that's not really familiar with Tesla in your car and uh, or even a brand new owner of a Tesla vehicle. One of the first questions they ask about it, oh, you have the full self driving package. Oh yeah, you can drive. It can drive itself. Like they, they assume that. Like it's, it's, it's just, it's just something that gets into the the side guys kind of kind of thing. All right, Michael Smithers says ship model two east and model three and Y. I think he meant west between India and China and keeps the ships full both ways. That'd be funny. Yeah. Uh, Tesla faces scrutiny after Angela Chow death and Model X report that family yeah. does not fault tesla yeah that was kind of uh, a weird one said and i had a, a weird conversation about that uh, some miscommunication i thought set went full conspiracy theory on me i was like starting to get worried for him uh but yeah like this like i think there was some confusion about that from from the tesla community where uh some or people thought that there was a new uh model x with the yeah, yeah, the the more recent model shifter where you have to sh shift on the screen or the automatic shifter, uh, if if you will, rather than the stock. But she had a 2020 model S with the stock, so it was just uh, unfortunate, very unfortunate, terrible way to die, uh, mistake that people do with with the stock. It happens, especially people like that are not used to trucks, because tr this is a, a way to a gear selection system that's more popular with trucks. So she she admitted to her friend that this it's something that she has a problem with that she uh, she made mistake with that before. For those people who don't know, she put it in reverse instead of drive, and she she reversed into her pond and drowned in, in the car, which is a horrific way to die. Yeah, apparently it took like an hour, and they were trying to get her out. It's just really yeah. horrible. All right, moving on. Mike the car geek, uh, Waymo is keeping Jaguar in business. Yeah. I, yeah. I think uh, that's interesting. I wonder how many 
uh, of the Jaguars uh, iPaces that are out there are in Google's hands. Uh, the, the downward machine, it's frustrating to see homeowners talking about second and third chargers. Sorry about that. When so many apartment dwellers can't get one. Don't know what to tell you. Um, you know, we have a, a teenage son who's going to be driving a Chevy Bolt soon. So we're looking at a third charger. Sorry. Yeah, I, I know it's frustrating, especially like I, I've heard also for a condo organization like HOA trying to convince your HOA to let you install a charger. Uh, th these things are unfortunate. I, I think there's going to be uh, a momentum at some point where this is going to be less of a problem. But I know right now it's uh, it's not it's not the easiest thing to do. All right. Well, Robert Palmer says it was got ya journalism uh, and a smear job. He doesn't have to answer questions over and over. Some things are private. So talking about the Don Lemon interview, I guess. Uh, so it sounds like hey. we might have a big Elon fan here. And uh, he takes regular drug tests. I guess he's on the inside. Come on, guys. Yeah, I don't, I don't, some people said that, but like I've I've looked at to the the regulation for like defense contractor, and like this, I don't think that's that much of a like a regular thing. Uh, Mark Webb has a interesting, I guess, last comment here. Elon has become such an unpleasant person over the last two years, assuming and blaming this on drug use is almost a kinder explanation. <laughs> Than accepting that he's always been a dick. Yeah, yeah. I, I had the whole tweet this uh, last week about that, like kind of realization of like, am I? Uh, my in my head, I've I've been thinking like my opinion has changed on Elon in the last few years because he has changed in the last few years, or I just I, I kind of opened my eyes. I haven't seen that he's been an asshole all this time. Like I kind of, I'm not saying that that's the case. I'm saying that it might be the case, and and I I just I haven't seen it. So, yeah, I, I don't know the truth on, on that, but I, I we, it probably comes in a boat, I would assume. Like, he also changed a lot in the last few years. I mean, my theory has always been that uh, he's addicted to social media and he's kind, it's kind of a situation where he's addict, like, it's kind of a drug addict with 175 million drug pusher keep pushing him in drugs because he's right. addicted to social media and he has a giant following on it that keeps writing it so and obviously he's also in a weird situation where he's extremely influential both on and off social media through his wealth through his connection to his his companies so it's a very weird situation um like i i think i think the only like way out for him is like he has to delete twitter which is Ooh. impossible for him now because his wealth is now attached to that too. So he's, right. in, he's, he's financially incentivized to keep his social media uh, addiction. It's it's such a screwed up situation. I mean, I, I kind of feel bad for him to a degree because I, I could put myself in this situation. I don't know if I've been able, I would be able to, to pull out of that either. Yeah. I, I kind of, I would hope I, I would be, but I don't know. I don't know. It's yeah. a weird one. It's crazy. Anyway. Let's end on this note, a positive note. Let's hope that Elon's get a hold of his social media addiction. Uh, we all have issues in our life that we could do better on, and uh, that's probably the main one from Elon. Uh, all right. I appreciate every single one. There's apparently a 1,000 people watching right now over all the platform. That's awesome. I appreciate every single one of you. If you do enjoy the show, you can give us a quick like, book that, that, that stream up. Uh, it takes a second to do, and it helps the show a lot. Uh, you can also like, uh, you can subscribe, hit the notification button to know when we go live, though it's most of the time at 4 p.m. Uh, Friday Eastern time when we're not traveling all over the place to get you the whole the news. Uh, speaking of, why I was traveling that all this week is for a lunch that I cannot talk about, but I will be able to Monday morning, early morning. So when you guys wake up on Monday, you're not only going to have that Dun Lemon interview, you're going to have a, a brand new EV that we're going to discuss. And uh, if you're listening on your podcast app, you can give us um, a five-star rating. That also helps the show tremendously, and we appreciate every single one of you that does it. All right. Have a safe 